Translated by Bhikkhu Sujito. Sutta Central .net. Link Discourses 22. 1 Nikula's Father 058, SN.22.1 SN.22.11, SN.22.1. Nikula's Father So I Have Heard. At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Bagas on Crocodile Hill, in the deer park at Basakala's Wood. Then the householder Nikula's father went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to the Buddha, Sir, I'm an old man, elderly and senior. I'm advanced in years and have reached the final stage of life. My body is ailing and I'm constantly unwell. I hardly ever get to see the esteemed mendicants. May the Buddha please advise me, and instruct me. It will be for my lasting welfare and happiness. That's so true, householder. That's so true, householder. For this body is ailing, trapped in its shell. If anyone dragging around this body claimed to be healthy even for a minute, what's that but foolishness? So you should train like this, though my body is ailing, my mind will be healthy. That's how you should train. And then the householder Nikula's father approved and agreed with what the Buddha said. He got up from his seat, bowed, and respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right. Then he went up to Venerable Sariputta, bowed, and sat down to one side. Sariputta said to him, Householder, your faculties are so very clear, and your complexion is pure and bright. Did you get to hear a Dhamma talk in the Buddha's presence today? What else, sir, could it possibly be? Just now the Buddha anointed me with the deathless ambrosia of a Dhamma talk. But what kind of ambrosial Dhamma talk has the Buddha anointed you with? So Nikula's father told Sariputta all that had happened, and said, That's the ambrosial Dhamma talk that the Buddha anointed me with. But didn't you feel the need to ask the Buddha the further question, Sir, how do you define someone ailing in body and ailing in mind, and someone ailing in body and healthy in mind? Sir, we would travel a long way to learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of Venerable Sariputta. May Venerable Sariputta himself please clarify the meaning of this. Well then, householder, listen and pay close attention, I will speak. Yes, sir, replied Nikula's father. Sariputta said this. And how is a person ailing in body and ailing in mind? It's when an uneducated ordinary person has not seen the noble ones, and is neither skilled nor trained in the qualities of a noble one. They've not seen good persons, and are neither skilled nor trained in the qualities of a good person. They regard form as self, self as having form, form in self, or self in form. They're obsessed with the thought, I am form, form is mine. But that form of theirs decays and perishes which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard feeling as self, self as having feeling, feeling in self, or self in feeling. They're obsessed with the thought, I am feeling, feeling is mine. But that feeling of theirs decays and perishes, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard perception as self, self as having perception, perception in self, or self in perception. They're obsessed with the thought, I am perception, perception is mine. But that perception of theirs decays and perishes, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard choices as self, self as having choices, choices in self, or self in choices. They're obsessed with the thought, I am choices, choices are mine. But those choices of theirs decay and perish, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard consciousness as self, self as having consciousness, consciousness in self, or self in consciousness. They're obsessed with the thought, I am consciousness, consciousness is mine. But that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That's how a person is ailing in body and ailing in mind. And how is a person ailing in body and healthy in mind? 
It's when an educated noble disciple has seen the noble ones, and is skilled and trained in the teaching of the noble ones. They've seen good persons, and are skilled and trained in the teaching of the good persons. They don't regard form as self, self as having form, form in self, or self in form. They're not obsessed with the thought, I am form, form is mine. So when that form of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They don't regard feeling as self, self as having feeling, feeling in self, or self in feeling. They're not obsessed with the thought, I am feeling, feeling is mine. So when that feeling of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They don't regard perception as self, self as having perception, perception in self, or self in perception. They're not obsessed with the thought, I am perception, perception is mine. So when that perception of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They don't regard choices as self, self as having choices, choices in self, or self in choices. They're not obsessed with the thought, I am choices, choices are mine. So when those choices of theirs decay and perish, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They don't regard consciousness as self, self as having consciousness, consciousness in self, or self in consciousness. They're not obsessed with the thought, I am consciousness, consciousness is mine. So when that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That's how a person is ailing in body and healthy in mind. That's what Venerable Sariputta said. Satisfied, Nikula's father was happy with what Sariputta said. SN.22.2 at Devadaha So I have heard. At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans, where they have a town named Devadaha. Then several mendicants who were heading for the west went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, we wish to go to a western land to take up residence there. But mendicants, have you consulted with Sariputta? No, sir, we haven't. You should consult with Sariputta. He's astute, and supports his spiritual companions, the mendicants. Yes, sir, they replied. Now at that time Venerable Sariputta was meditating not far from the Buddha in a clump of golden shower trees. And then those mendicants approved and agreed with what the Buddha said. They got up from their seat, bowed, and respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on. They're right. Then they went up to Venerable Sariputta, and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, they sat down to one side and said to him, Reverend Sariputta, we wish to go to a western land to take up residence there. We have consulted with the teacher. Reverends, there are those who question a mendicant who has gone abroad, astute aristocrats, Brahmins, householders, and ascetics, for astute people are inquisitive, but what does the Venerables teacher teach? What does he explain? I trust the Venerables have properly heard, learned, attended, and remembered the teachings, and penetrated them with wisdom. That way, when answering you will repeat what the Buddha has said and not misrepresent him with an untruth. You will explain in line with the teaching, with no legitimate grounds for rebuke and criticism. Reverend, we would travel a long way to learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of Venerable Sariputta. May Venerable Sariputta himself please clarify the meaning of this. Well then, reverends, listen and pay close attention, I will speak. Yes. Reverend, they replied. Sariputta said this. Reverends, there are those who question a mendicant who has gone abroad, astute aristocrats, Brahmins, householders, and ascetics, for astute people are inquisitive, but what does the Venerable's teacher teach? What does he explain? When questioned like this, Reverends, you should answer, Reverend. Our teacher explained the removal of desire and lust. 
When you answer like this, such astute people may inquire further, but regarding what does the Venerable's teacher explain the removal of desire and lust? When questioned like this, reverends, you should answer, our teacher explains the removal of desire and lust for form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. When you answer like this, such astute people may inquire further, but what drawback has he seen that he teaches the removal of desire and lust for form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness? When questioned like this, reverends, you should answer, if you are not free of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for form, when that form decays and perishes it gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. If you are not free of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for feeling, perception, choices, consciousness, when that consciousness decays and perishes it gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. This is the drawback our teacher has seen that he teaches the removal of desire and lust for form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. When you answer like this, such astute people may inquire further, but what benefit has he seen that he teaches the removal of desire and lust for form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness? When questioned like this, reverends, you should answer, if you are rid of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for form, when that form decays and perishes it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. If you are rid of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for feeling, perception, choices, consciousness, when that consciousness decays and perishes it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. This is the benefit our teacher has seen that he teaches the removal of desire and lust for form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. If those who acquired and kept unskillful qualities were to live happily in the present life, free of anguish, distress, and fever, and if, when their body breaks up, after death, they could expect to go to a good place, the Buddha would not praise giving up unskillful qualities. But since those who acquire and keep unskillful qualities live unhappily in the present life, full of anguish, distress, and fever, and since, when their body breaks up, after death, they can expect to go to a bad place, the Buddha praises giving up unskillful qualities. If those who embraced and kept skillful qualities were to live unhappily in the present life, full of anguish, distress, and fever, and if, when their body breaks up, after death, they could expect to go to a bad place, the Buddha would not praise embracing skillful qualities. But since those who embrace and keep skillful qualities live happily in the present life, free of anguish, distress, and fever, and since, when their body breaks up, after death, they can expect to go to a good place, the Buddha praises embracing skillful qualities. This is what Venerable Sariputta said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what Sariputta said. SN.22.3 with Halitakani. So I have heard. At one time Venerable Mahakakana was staying in the land of the Avantis near Kuraragara on steep mountain. Then the householder Halitakani went up to Venerable Mahakakana, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, this was said by thee. Buddha in the Chapter of the Eights, in the Questions of Megandiya. After leaving shelter to become an unsettled migrant, a sage doesn't get close to anyone in town. Rid of sensual pleasures, expecting nothing. They don't argue with anyone. How should we see the detailed meaning of the Buddha's brief statement? Householder, the form element is a shelter for consciousness. One whose consciousness is Shackled to greed for the form element is called a migrant going from shelter to shelter. The feeling element is a shelter for consciousness. One whose consciousness is attached to greed for the feeling element is called a migrant going from shelter to shelter. The perception element is a shelter for consciousness. One whose consciousness is attached to greed for the perception element is called a migrant going from shelter to shelter. The choices element is a shelter for consciousness. One whose consciousness is attached to greed for the choices element is called a migrant going from shelter to shelter. 
that's how one is a migrant going from shelter to shelter. And how is one a migrant without a shelter? The realized one has given up any desire, greed, relishing, and craving for the form element, any attraction, grasping, mental fixation, insistence, and underlying tendencies. He has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, obliterated it, so it's unable to arise in the future. That's why the realized one is called a migrant without a shelter. The realized one has given up any desire, greed, relishing, and craving for the feeling element. The perception element, the choices element, the consciousness element, any attraction, grasping, mental fixation, insistence, and underlying tendencies. He has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, obliterated it, so it's unable to arise in the future. That's why the realized one is called a migrant without a shelter. That's how one is a migrant without a shelter. And how is one a migrant going from settlement to settlement? Being attached to migrating from settlement to settlement in pursuit of sites, one is called a migrant going from settlement to settlement. Being attached to migrating from settlement to settlement in pursuit of sounds, smells, tastes, touches, thoughts, one is called a migrant going from settlement to settlement. That's how one is a migrant going from settlement to settlement. And how is one an unsettled migrant? The realized one has given up attachment to migrating from settlement to settlement in pursuit of sites. He has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, obliterated it, so it's unable to arise in the future. That's why the realized one is called an unsettled migrant. The realized one has given up attachment to migrating from settlement to settlement in pursuit of sounds, smells, tastes, touches, thoughts. He has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, obliterated it, so it's unable to arise in the future. That's why the realized one is called an unsettled migrant. That's how one is an unsettled migrant. And how does one get close to people in town? It's when someone mixes closely with lay people, sharing their joys and sorrows, happy when they're happy and sad when they're sad, and getting involved in their business. That's how one gets close to people in town. And how does one not get close to people in town? It's when a mendicant doesn't mix closely with lay people, not sharing their joys and sorrows, not happy when they're happy or sad when they're sad, and not getting involved in their business. That's how one doesn't get close to people in town. And how is one not rid of sensual pleasures? It's when someone isn't rid of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for sensual pleasures. That's how one is not rid of sensual pleasures. And how is one rid of sensual pleasures? It's when someone is rid of greed, desire, fondness, thirst, passion, and craving for sensual pleasures. That's how one is rid of sensual pleasures. And how does one have expectations? It's when someone thinks, in the future, may I be of such form, such feeling, such perception, such choices, and such consciousness. That's how one has expectations. And how does one expect nothing? It's when someone doesn't think, in the future, May I be of such form, such feeling, such perception, such choices, and such consciousness. That's how one expects nothing. And how does one argue with people? It's when someone takes part in this sort of discussion, you don't understand this teaching and training. I understand this teaching and training. What? You understand this teaching and training. You're practicing wrong. I'm practicing right. You said last what you should have said first. You said first what you should have said last. I stay on topic, you don't. What you've thought so much about has been disproved. Your doctrine is refuted. Go on, save your doctrine. You're trapped, get yourself out of this, if you can. That's how one argues with people. And how does one not argue with people? It's when a mendicant doesn't take part in this sort of discussion, you don't understand this teaching and training, get yourself out of this, if you can. That's how one doesn't argue with people. 
So, householder, that's how to understand the detailed meaning of what the Buddha said in brief in the chapter of the Eights, in the questions of Megandiya. After leaving shelter to become an unsettled migrant, a sage doesn't get close to anyone in town. Rid of sensual pleasures, expecting nothing. They don't argue with anyone. SN.22.4 Hey Litakani, 2nd. So I have heard. At one time Venerable Mahakakana was staying in the land of the Avantis near Kuraragara on steep mountain. Then the householder Hey Litakani went up to Venerable Mahakakana, and asked him, Sir, this was said by the Buddha in the questions of Sakha, those ascetics and Brahmins who are freed due to the ending of craving have reached the ultimate goal, the ultimate sanctuary, they ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate end, and are best among gods and humans. How should we see the detailed meaning of the Buddha's brief statement? Householder, consider any desire, greed, relishing, and craving for the form element, any attraction, grasping, mental fixation, insistence, and underlying tendencies. With the ending, fading away, cessation, giving away, and letting go of that, the mind is said to be well freed. Consider any desire, greed, relishing, and craving for the feeling element, the perception element, the choices element, the consciousness element, any attraction, grasping, mental fixation, insistence, and underlying tendencies. With the ending, fading away, cessation, giving away, and letting go of that, the mind is said to be well freed. So, householder, that's how to understand the detailed meaning of what the Buddha said in brief in the questions of Sakha, those ascetics and Brahmins who are freed due to the ending of craving have reached the ultimate goal, the ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate end, and are best among gods and humans. SN.22.5 Development of Immersion So I have heard. At Savathi. Mendicants, develop immersion. A mendicant who has immersion truly understands. What do they truly understand? The origin and ending of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. And what is the origin of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness? It's when a mendicant approves, welcomes, and keeps clinging. What do they approve, welcome, and keep clinging to? They approve, welcome, and keep clinging to form. This gives rise to relishing. Relishing forms is grasping. Their grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition that gives rise to old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. They approve, welcome, and keep clinging to feeling, perception, choices, consciousness. This gives rise to relishing. Relishing consciousness is grasping. Their grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition that gives rise to old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. This is the origin of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. And what is the ending of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness? It's when a mendicant doesn't approve, welcome, or keep clinging. What don't they approve, welcome, or keep clinging to? They don't approve, welcome, or keep clinging to form. As a result, relishing of form ceases. When that relishing ceases, grasping ceases. When grasping ceases, continued. Existence ceases. That is how this entire mass of suffering ceases. They don't approve, welcome, or keep clinging to feeling, perception, choices, consciousness. As a result, relishing of consciousness ceases. When that relishing ceases, grasping ceases. That is how this entire mass of suffering ceases. This is the ending of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. SN.22.6 Retreat At Savathi Mendicants, meditate and retreat. 
A mendicant in retreat truly understands. What do they truly understand? The origin and ending of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. Expand in detail as in the previous discourse. SN.22.7 Anxiety because of grasping. At Savathi. Mendicants, I will teach you how grasping leads to anxiety, and how not grasping leads to freedom from anxiety. Listen and pay close attention, I will speak. Yes, sir, they replied. The Buddha said this. And how does grasping lead to anxiety? It's when an uneducated ordinary person has not seen the noble ones, and is neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the noble ones. They've not seen good persons, and are neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the good persons. They regard form as self, self as having form, form in self, or self in form. But that form of theirs decays and perishes, and consciousness latches on to the perishing of form. Anxieties occupy their mind, born of latching on to the perishing of form, and originating in accordance with natural principles. So they become frightened, worried, concerned, and anxious because of grasping. They regard feeling as self. They regard perception as self. They regard choices as self. They regard consciousness as self, self is. Having consciousness, consciousness in self, or self in consciousness. But that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, and consciousness latches on to the perishing of consciousness. Anxieties occupy their mind, born of latching on to the perishing of consciousness, and originating in accordance with natural principles. So they become frightened, worried, concerned, and anxious because of grasping. That's how grasping leads to anxiety. And how does not grasping lead to freedom? From anxiety? It's when an educated noble disciple has seen the noble ones, and is skilled and trained in the teaching of the noble ones. They've seen good persons, and are skilled and trained in the teaching of the good persons. They don't regard form as self, self as having form, form in self, or self in form. When that form of theirs decays and perishes, consciousness doesn't latch on to the perishing of form. Anxieties, born of latching on to the perishing of form and originating in accordance with natural principles, don't occupy their mind. So they don't become frightened, worried, concerned, or anxious because of grasping. They don't regard feeling as self. They don't regard perception as self. They don't regard choices as self. They don't regard consciousness as self. When that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, consciousness doesn't latch on to the perishing of consciousness. Anxieties, born of latching on to the perishing of consciousness and originating in accordance with natural principles, don't occupy their mind. So they don't become frightened, worried, concerned, or anxious. Because of grasping. That's how not grasping leads to freedom from anxiety. SN.22.8 Anxiety because of grasping, second. At Savathi. Mendicants, I will teach you how grasping leads to anxiety, and how not grasping leads to freedom from anxiety. Listen and pay close attention, I will speak. And how does grasping lead to anxiety? It's when an uneducated ordinary person regards form like this, this is mine, I am this, this is myself. But that form of theirs decays and perishes, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard feeling, perception, choices, consciousness like this, this is mine, I am this, this is myself. But that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, which gives rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That's how grasping leads to anxiety. And how does not grasping lead to freedom from anxiety? It's when an educated noble disciple regards form like this, this is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. When that form of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They regard feeling, perception, choices, consciousness like this, this is not mine, 
I am not this, this is not myself. When that consciousness of theirs decays and perishes, it doesn't give rise to sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That's how not grasping leads to freedom from anxiety. SN.22.9 Impermanence in the Three Times At Savathi Mendicants, form of the past and future is impermanent, let alone the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past form, doesn't look forward to enjoying future form, and they practice for disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present form. Feeling Perception Choices Consciousness of the past and future is impermanent, let alone the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past consciousness, doesn't look forward to enjoying future consciousness, and they practice for disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present consciousness. SN.22.10 Suffering in the Three Times At Savathi Mendicants, form of the past and future is Suffering not to mention the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past form, doesn't look forward to enjoying future form, and they practice for disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present form. Feeling Perception Choices Consciousness of the past and future is Suffering, let alone the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past consciousness, doesn't look forward to enjoying future consciousness, and they practice for disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present consciousness. SN.22.11 Not Self in the Three Times At Savathi Mendicants, form of the past and future is not Self, let alone the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past form, doesn't look forward to enjoying future form, and they practice for disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present form. Feeling Perception Choices Consciousness of the past and future is not Self, let alone the present. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple doesn't worry about past consciousness doesn't look forward to enjoying future consciousness, and they practice for the disillusionment, dispassion, and cessation regarding present consciousness.